All right. Welcome back, everybody. Yep. Um. All right, so today I want to talk about multi-core. Hopefully you had a good mini break and then you recharge a little bit so that we can uh, finish this last few weeks of the quarter. Uh, so this is the last concept that we're gonna talk about. And what's that? It's uh, just the last thing that we're gonna talk about in this class uh, about multi-cores. Uh, we're going to talk about two important things in multi-core systems, coherency and consistency. And uh, that would be basically the last thing that is going to be on your quiz three, which is going to be, I think, Thursday of next week, uh, the last session of the class. Uh, so yeah, we have lots of things to discuss. Don't forget about your project as well. I think we also started uh, grading the, the quiz two. I don't know when it finishes. Hopefully next week. Well, let's see. Any questions, anybody? before we move on, we're good. All right, so the last thing kind of we discussed uh, two weeks before was kind of like finishing the system on chips uh, and hopefully you can now understand all part of it. And and now we kind of like going a step back and see where, where are we, right? And, and we are kind of like here at the end of uh, this hitting the power wall thing which essentially the idea was that we could no longer improve our processors. We kind of like pivot and talk a little bit about uh, uh, memory and caching and main memory and all those things. But now we want to go back to the processor and see how we kind of improved our design of the processor, okay? Uh, so basically all things that we discussed so far is the design of what we call a uni processor. Uh, and in the uni processor, essentially what we have is a single program runs for any given time, right? Uh, and then what we have in, in a processor is within a processor, one uni processor, we can have what this, what we call a thread. Okay. So a thread is kind of like, you can think about it as kind of like a smaller part of a core where we have states per thread, including the, the PC and registers, we have the stack, and then we have some other shared, you know, uh, parts of, of, of the memory, uh, and we already discussed how we share the memory and so on. And essentially, each process is assigned to this, to this threads, okay? So one single core can have multiple threads, physical threads, and what will happen is that then you can have multiple processes running on the same physical core, okay? And then there's a whole bunch of, oh, okay, how do we manage processes and how do we do multitasking? Uh, if I have multiple different programs that I want to run in this one single system. Uh, so essentially the idea of a uni processor is that we're gonna have one core or one thread. So far we just talked about one thread and everything gonna run there, and essentially they're going to be either a bare metal system where there's going to be only one task running on this unit processor, or there should be some operating system that's kind of orchestrating the, the uh, execution of these tasks. So there's this notion of what we call a context switch, which essentially what happens is that if one process is running on the on the core, this process will be stopped by the OS and another process will be inserted into the, into the core and then we're gonna keep doing this in order to be able to achieve multitasking, okay? So early days of computers, we only have one thread, one core, and if you wanted to achieve multitasking, we would have done this, okay? Um, and this is usually the role of operating system. And again, this is kind of like a very, very large part of any operating system class that you're taking, talking about how do we manage the processes, how do we generate a process, how we kill a process, how do we context switch and stuff like that, which we're not gonna talk about in this course. If you remember a long time ago, we talked about this thing called ILP or instruction level parallelism. If you remember, we start with like just a one unit of pipeline and we said that, okay, why don't we actually create multiple of these pipelines, uh, right? 
and we call that a, a super scalar processor, right? So a scalar processor was one that only had one line of, of pipeline, but then super scalar was the ones that kind of like have now multiple of them, okay? And we call that the instruction level parallelism because essentially we run multiple instructions at the same time. So the idea of uh, uh, the instruction level parallelism was like being able to run multiple instructions at the same time in, into your pipeline. We talked about uh, its inefficiencies, including the data dependency, the branch predictor problem, and the memory latency. Uh, so, and, and then we kind of solved this with, with introducing the idea of out-of-order execution, basically saying that, okay, if I have a larger window and I can kind of run different things at different times, I can make this thing faster, right? So that was kind of like where we were with the ILP. But ILP itself and out of order itself has its own limitations, kind of like I'm showing it in this graph. Consider this FU units that we talked about when we were discussing out of order execution. For example, let's say I have four different FUs. If you remember, like the problem that we had was utilizing all these FUs, right? Because there were dependencies in our reservation stations. We couldn't really issue one instruction for all the FUs. There might not be enough instruction to be issued by FUs and so on and so forth. So essentially what will happen is in many cases, this FUs becomes what we call underutilized, right? And in order to achieve the performance, to gain this performance that we really want from our systems, we really want this FUs to be utilized 100% of the time. So we want all of these kind of boxes to be white, which means that they are being used. So all of these kind of red boxes here are under utilization. It's the, it's the price that we are paying because of we don't either have enough instruction to pump into these FUs or because of some form of branch prediction errors or because of dependencies we cannot really issue. Okay. So what we can do in order to fix this, uh, what we can do in order to fix this is basically kind of uh, 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 extending the idea of ILP, but in the thread domain, right? So the idea is why don't we kind of mix all the programs now that I have available spaces, okay? So for example, let's say I have one program here that looks like this. I have another program, this is like program B and this is program A. And, and, and then these programs kind of like using the FUs with this pattern. If I combine these two together, I can have something that is always fully utilized, okay? So I can have something like this that, for example, at this point, this is for A, okay, A, A, A. And maybe like one of these can also go inside and this would be for B. And then in the next cycle, for example, I have this one A, and then I can use these other two Bs and maybe the ones that remains from here as well. So essentially, now that I have multiple programs that I need to kind of feed my functional units, if I can interleave this and then have uh, a reservation station for program A and reservation station for program B, both of which can kind of feed into uh, my functional unit, then I can have you know, almost perfect utilization. Like can, I can have uh, you know, almost 100% utilization in this in the system because now I have much more options, okay? This is what we call kind of simultaneous multi-threading or thread level parallelism. The idea of SMT is that we can actually run multiple programs on same physical hardware, uh, which we call thread or core. And what we do, what we need to do is kind of finding a way to kind of sharing the reservation station and sharing the other part of our pipeline to multiple programs at the same time. If you do that, then there is a whole bunch of more things that we can we can we can use uh, and and share together and utilize together. Okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, well, one thing to note is that these are separate programs. So having separate programs introduce lots of complexity. Okay. So for example, X3 in program A is it's completely different than X3 in program B, right? So these are two different things, although their names are the same. So all of these checkings and all of these kind of like, you know, 
uh, uh, conditions, for branches, for, for, for data dependency, et cetera, et cetera, now becomes per process. So within process, we still have all those things that we had before, but between process, we don't care anymore, right? So the complexity grows similar to the way that we introduced superscalar and showed you that there are a whole bunch of new complexity that comes with this, but the, the main advantage of this, this format is now I have the opportunity of utilizing all of my resources at the same time, okay? This is what we call simultaneous multi-threading or SMT. Uh, that's, the, that's the idea. Let me talk a little bit about this, that how do we implement this? So essentially for SMT, what we need is that each thread needs its own PC, needs its own register file, uh, requires its own logic for virtual address translation, and, and require a method for kind of like exception handling or any sort of flushing that we need to do, okay? Uh, we don't need extra memory, we don't need extra reservation station, and we don't need extra ROB, because these they can be only shared and each one can be tagged by the process. But since the register file is completely different, I need another register file. And, 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 and since I, I kind of fetching from different parts of the memory, I need a different PC. And of course, since one process, for example, might need to be flushed while the other one doesn't need to be flushed, I need a different logic for, for exception handling and, and interrupt handling. But if I kind of duplicate these things the same way that we duplicate this for, uh, for our superscalar, then we are good to go and we can achieve what we call a simultaneous multi-thread multi question. The question is, is the process that how do these data is being shared between, between different processes? We already discussed that in the memory side, right? So like when we're doing the paging and paging translation, there was this metadata that we stored that shows that whether this page is shared among different processes, right? The question is, would there be a check between multiple processes when we do SMT? Again, if there is data in the memory, then you store it in local registers, right? So then you will be good to go if they're in, in their individual registers. If you still need to read it from the memory, then, then you read it from the page tables and that's where you know whether this is shared or not, right? So, so you fix that issue. But we're gonna talk a lot about sharing actually once we get into the multi-core. All right. Uh, so the SMT data path, you can think about this as, as something like this, that remember I told you that this is kind of like we are adding multiple layers uh, to, to my like, you know, instruction memory and then multiple layers to my register file and so on and so forth. You can think about SMT as kind of like adding this in this Z layer, right? So I'm kind of like, you know, uh, think about it as having multiple of this kind of in this 3D dimensions, right? So we had this 2D dimension of pipelining and adding more ports to each, uh, to each stage. What, I'm, what we're gonna do with SMT is essentially kind of duplicating this into the Z domain. And as I said, not everything needs to be duplicated, for example, this instruction memory is essentially the it's the same thing. It's one giant memory that has now multiple ports. But for example, your register file now needs to be duplicated into uh, into multiple uh, into multiple different register files, right? So you're kind of like, of course, you're adding more and more hardware to your system. But the advantage of this is that now I can feed more in, more things into my functional units. Does that make sense? Uh, so one thing to, to remember is that there is difference between context switching and generally multitasking and SMT, okay? Uh, so you can always run multiple tasks on the same core if you do time multiplexing, like the, the, the figure that I'm showing here, okay? So for example, you have one application and then you stop running this application, you do context switch and you run another application, okay? This, is, this has nothing to do with what we call simultaneous multi-threading, which essentially you run both applications at the same time, okay? So context switch is different than simultaneous multi-threading. Both can achieve the same thing, but SMT gives you a significantly faster execution, right? 
In fact, uh, we actually have this much more complex view of running things. So the, the first one is basically kind of a conventional processor, which we run one process, a green process, for example, for some time. Then we decide that we need to context switch and run another process. So this grayish area in between is basically when we are doing the context switch, when the OS takes over. And then this yellow thing here is when the, the next program, next press kind of takes, uh, you know, takes control and run, okay? We, this is just generally what we have learned so far, a con conventional processor, okay? Then we have all these other three things. Uh, uh, if my uh, pen works. Then we have all these uh, other three things, which we call coarse grain multi-threading, uh, fine grain multi-threading, and then simultaneous multi-threading. So we have CMT, FMT, and SMT. The difference between them, all of them gives you some form of simultaneous multi-threading. The difference between them is that this coarse grain one is essentially telling you that at any given point, I can only run one thread. But if I want to switch between them, I can switch between them very, very quickly using the hardware, not the operating system, okay? So I can, I can basically run this uh, first uh, thread and then uh, I can run the second thread. But as you can see, there is no kind of space between them. That what used to be OS taking over and spending a lot of time now can be very quickly switched because we are adding more hardware. So this basically this part is done by hardware, okay? And then I can keep switching between different threads, okay? We call this a core screen multi-threading. Uh, the second option is what we call a fine grain multi-threading, which the difference between this one, the second one and third one is that instead of like doing this for some cycles and then switching to another thread, I can essentially do the same thing every single cycle, okay? So for example, in one cycle, I can run green, then I can run blue, then I can run red, then I can, you know, yellow, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So every cycle I can switch, but again, at every given cycle, only one thread is being executed. And finally, the simultaneous multi-threading is the, is the combination of these two. It's essentially saying that not only I can switch in every clock cycle, but within each clock cycle, I can combine these things together. So basically, it will look like something like this, where essentially you have maybe two of your FUs are, are, are green, the other two are red. Then I have another one that is kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's green and then it's yellow and it's blue, and maybe three yellows and then blue. So I kind of mix and match everything I want. And this is kind of like the fastest and the most uh, complex, but the most efficient one among all these four different options. Okay. Yeah. Uh, say the first part again. So the question is, is SMT being used all the time or there are places that we don't use? So first of all, all of your modern systems have SMT. And the only place that you don't want to do SMT is maybe for security reasons that you don't want to share anything because adding sharing, you know, create a lot of, lot of issues. Uh, but in most cases, you just do it uh, and there's no reason not to do it. It's the same as whether we want to do super scalar, just one, one core at a time. Uh, the question is, is the number of parallel threads that you can have in SMT is kind of limited? Yes, it's same as like we have a four issue processor. You can have a multiple, like multiple simultaneous threads. Uh, it's, it's a limited number. Yeah. Uh, here. Uh, so the question is, what does this show? Uh, yeah, so this is every clock. It's the FU units in every clock cycle. So let's say this is a four issue processor uh, that you have four four FU units. Uh, this is basically, this, this different colors show you different processes and then it just shows how this FUs are being utilized. Yeah. Slightly different as well, but the thread doesn't have processes or? 
So the question is, does the thread shows pro So thread is a little bit more higher level than the processes. There are formal definitions for what is a process, what is a what is a thread. I didn't go through it because it's, again, it's you kind know, of offering system concept that you have to learn on a separate course. But generally, think about address space. Uh, so I actually had it somewhere here. I think. Uh, yeah. So you think about thread as just like actual physical units that has register file and, and its own PC and so on. Uh, uh, process is kind of like a thread, but it's its own memory space. It's a smaller unit. It's more of a, it's not a physical unit. Thread is actual physical unit. Process is, is within that, okay? So the way that this works is that operating system creates processes for you. But when you're actually running this, uh, Harvard understands the threads and it creates threads for this. But again, uh, for now, you can consider these as the same thing. When you're actually like going deep into the operating system and how it works, you will understand these are two separate things. Okay, so for, for virtual Yeah, so in this case, we have four functional units. And we can, let's say, for example, have either four threads or 16 threads, depends on what the system looks like, yeah. All right, so this is kind of like the best you can do out of one core, okay? You can have multiple threads running at the same time and, and that's it. Now the question becomes, can I make this a 16 F units. Why don't I have a 32, you know, functional units, right? And then that's where that idea of the power wall and making the processor so big that we cannot really make any changes comes into the play. So we, we kind of went with this idea and said, okay, it seems that I can make fully utilized systems. Why don't I make this even bigger? Maybe having 16 instead of four. And, and that's where like we had so much power generated in the processor in the core that we couldn't really scale this up anymore, okay? That's kind of what prevented us to make this more than this, okay? So what we did instead was the idea of what we call multi-core systems, with essentially instead of like putting everything in one single core, we designed different separate, physically separate cores and kind of find a way to kind of share data between these cores, okay? And again, the reason for this was mainly for power and for, uh, for feasible feasibility reasons. We couldn't make our cores bigger, so that's why we keep them constant and we add more cores to it, okay? Uh, so when we talk about multi-cores, there are multiple different things that we need to think about. Uh, first of all, how do we leverage multiple cores? How do we get actually performance out of this multi-core systems is one thing that we need to think about. Then there will be some design choices that we're gonna talk about. But then the main things that we're gonna talk about in this lecture in the next lecture is the challenges that this multi-core and this sharing will bring. There are actually two main issues that it's gonna create, and we're gonna talk about those two main issues when we're talking about multi-core systems. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that this is gonna go for multi-core instead of multi-core because of the power limitation. Mm -hmm. If we just add more cores, is that gonna also increase the power rate? Uh, so the question is, if the issue is the power, uh, why don't we add, why don't, why adding more cores to the systems solve that? The problem that we have with power was, each individual core needs to be separately powered and needs to be separately uh, uh, controlled in the terms of temperature, okay? If you make this very, very, like, you know, if you actually make this lot, like, you know, add a lot of transistors here, the power dissipation and, and, and the heat dissipation becomes a big challenge. But if I make this like this, I essentially kind of create two separate units. Now I have more pins, I can, push more power, I can have more, you know, larger area for, for heat dissipation and so on. So, uh, but again, at some point, we're gonna reach into this problem that we call dark silicon, that this whole unit cannot also be powered because the amount of power that goes inside the system itself is limited. And that's where now we are shifting to other methods, which we call triplet systems. That's kind of 
break this down even further and so on and so forth, which we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about next week. But for now, essentially, I cannot make this bigger, but I can create multiple copies of the smaller ones. That's the idea. Yeah. Yes, we kind of like that. So the comment is we kind of maxed out on the clock speed, but now we can have multiple instances of the same core. And that's how we get performance. Yes. All right. So what you will see is that in reality, multi-core system is supposed to be kind of the image on the left. In reality, it's kind of a mess on the right. So we're going to talk about this kind of mess that we're going to, we're going to see in this course, uh, in this uh, system. And, and then one last thing before jumping into the actual topic is, is it come, like, you know, look into kind of different designs. Not every system that we have is a multi-core systems. So for example, most of our embedded system domain processors are in order, they don't have any virtualization, they don't have any multi-core systems. But many, many of our systems, including our PCs and our servers, or multi-core systems or out of order systems, they do have operating system and they do have virtualization. So I want you to understand that there is tiers of designs, not everything is a multi-core, not everything needs to be a multi-core system, okay? All right. So a multi-core system will look something like this, okay? You have a bunch of different cores, let's say four cores, uh, and then you have your memory system, and the memory system needs to be connected to your cores, and this connection is usually through some interconnect. Uh, 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 two weeks ago, I talked about the I.O. and the buses and all those things. This is basically where those buses comes into the play, so you have some, some idea about this interconnect now. The big thing about this interconnect is that the connections and, and the communication within the core is very fast, but the communication between cores, since it needs to go through the interconnect, is significantly slower, okay? So that's a big thing that you have to remember, that the communication between core and memory or core between cores, since it needs to go through the communication, uh, the interconnect, is significantly slower than, for example, if I had anything inside this core that it needs to, to talk to each other, okay? So that's one thing we were doing, and of course, there's lots of research in this domain. Again, when I'm talking about triplets a little bit next, next week, you'll see that how we make this problem go away a little bit, okay? But our conventional systems, including all of your laptops and, and cell phones and so on, has this interconnect in between them, which is significantly slower than the general CPU. Okay, uh, so before actually going into the design of, of multi-core, let's actually see how multi-core helps, right? So why adding more cores can give us speed up, okay? Uh, so for, there are two things that kind of multi-core systems helps you, all right? The first one is helping you with multitasking, and the second one is helping you with what we'll call thread level paddles, okay? Uh, and these are not the same, okay? And, and, and one thing that we I want to talk about is also AMDOS law. So I'm going to come back to this. Let's first talk about the multitasking. Uh, and then, by the way, we have the, the, we have the SMT already in our system. So we are assuming that each core already has SMT. So adding multiple cores, uh, I mean, even within one core, we still have multitasking if you want to. Uh, but generally, multitasking with more cores means that now you have more real estate to do more things at the same time. Uh, this is mostly just helping you with qualities, you know, quality of the service kind of thing. So you can have multiple tabs, you can have multiple applications running at the same time. For example, if you're utilizing a, a server, bunch of different people wants to use a server, each person can use one core to run their own things and so on and so forth. So individual applications doesn't get faster, but collectively things get faster because now I have more, more kind of workers, more cores at my disposal. So I can run things faster in that sense, okay? But for one, if I only had one application, adding more cores doesn't help. So that's one thing to remember that uh, adding more cores doesn't make one particular application faster, but if I have many, many different tasks, collectively they become fast, okay? So 
how do I actually improve one program? Because when we are talking about performance, if you remember back in the day when we were talking about performance, we said that we are interested in the CPU time of one application. We are not interested in CPU time of four applications. We want to make one application much, much faster, okay? So how do we actually multicore can help us with that? That's the question that I want to answer in this, in this lecture. Uh, so basically this is what we, what we call parallel programming or trail level parallelism. The idea is this, let me give you like a very simple example. You probably have seen it in, 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 in your, your other courses. I think CS133 is the parallel computing, right? How many of you have taken 133? No. 152 maybe? No. Anyway, so, so the idea of power processing is this. Let's say, for example, I have 64 thousands number, okay? And I want to do a sum of these, okay? So, so I have a, this giant array that I want to compute the sum, okay? Uh, of course, the first thing I can do is that I can run a for loop and then just go through every single instance and then compute the sum. And if I have a faster process processor, I can run this faster. That's, that was the thing that we discussed throughout this course so far. But now the idea is that if I have 64 core in the system, can I somehow make this 64 times faster, okay? And here's what I'm going to do. I'm basically going to partition the numbers uh, uh, into 1,000 groups, okay? into 64 groups of each group is 1,000 numbers, and I'm gonna distribute this into different processors, okay? What, then what I'm going to do is that basically I'm gonna run this simple for loop, but, but look at the, basically this kind of like indexes that I'm using. So I'm gonna you compute the partial sums first, saying that, okay, each core, you have 1,000 numbers, compute the partial sum locally on your, on your cores, send me the partial sums, and then one of the cores can gather these numbers and then just sum that 1,000 numbers together and gets the final value that we have, right? So essentially, if you think about this, is that with this divide and concur kind of algorithm, with this scatter-gather algorithm, we are essentially kind of make this process of summing 64,000 numbers six, almost 64 times faster, right? Because what used to be a, a for loop that starts from zero goes all the way to 64,000, now it only goes from zero to 1,000, right? Because each core doing this, and since I have 64 cores, now I can run this in power. And this data is independent from each other. The only thing that needs to be kind of you know, computed at the end is, is this partial sums to get, right? So this is how we actually kind of doing these uh, we are getting this, this performance out of a multi-core system, okay? The multi-core systems, if you have like a Malab and a, and a Google Chrome, it's not gonna make your Google Chrome or Malab faster, but if you manage to write a program that's truly parallel, such that it can actually utilize all of your cores at the same time, then you can technically make that n times faster if you have n cores. Does that make sense? Uh, Parallelism, although, and running parallel algorithm is not a given, okay? It's not a trivial task. It's a very, very complex thing to write. Uh, not all the, all the systems are parallelizable. And if, I, if you remember, I told you about the Amdahl's law. And if you remember in Amdahl's law, I told you that essentially the speed up that you can get is, is two part, the sequential part and the parallel part. The parallel part, I can divide it by n and make it n times faster, but the sequential part, I cannot do anything about this, right? And these two things are added together and that's your total runtime, right? So in order to achieve this performance benefits that we want from a, from a multi-core system, I need to write my program such that this part is really, really small and everything is can be can be parallelized. For the sum example, this is very simple, but not all our algorithms are truly parallelizable, right? And as I said, if you're taking this kind of like uh, 251B, I think, it's the parallel programming, 
and 133, I think, is, is the other one. Generally, if you're interested in taking courses in parallel programming, there are, there are options that you can think about. Uh, but it's its 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 own domain, it's its own field. How do we actually change my algorithms from something that is purely sequential to something that is very, very powerful? So it's, but it's not a trivial task to do, okay? And then another thing that we, we need to be worried about is the communication overhead and the sequential part. So every time that I need to send something from one core to another core, I need to be careful. Uh, every sequential part is it it's, it's, it's needs to be kind of handled and so on and so forth. But the bottom line is that there are many, many algorithms that can be written in a parallel format and can benefit from multi-core systems. Genomics, uh, uh, supercomputers for quantum, uh, you know, things for weathers. Uh, there are many, many agriculture. There are many, many algorithms that these days are being, you know, benefited by having many, many core systems, okay? But not your everyday task, okay? So bottom line is if I have an algorithm that I can run in parallel, I can use multi-core to make it faster, okay? Any questions? All right. But in overall, one thing to remember is that necessarily not n core is going to give you n times faster system, but that's the hope, right? Similar to the superscalar that n issue processor does not make things n times faster, but hopefully it will. So you know, other words, we kind of you can have like an n to the power of two faster systems if I have n cores and n threads within each core, uh, but that's not something that we always get. Okay. And this is kind of like a, a meme uh, for for cores that not necessarily getting faster. But anyway, uh, uh, better algorithms is going to give us give us faster systems. But let's now talk about the multi-core system. So, so, so far, I just motivate the need for multi-core systems because I want to gain performance. But getting performance is not as easy as before. I need to change my algorithms to become parallel algorithms. But let's say somehow magically I can do that. And that's the story of a separate course. But if I have algorithms that are can utilize multiple cores, how do I build this multi-core systems? And that's the problem that we are interested in in this course, OK? Uh, so what changes when we are talking about multi-core systems? Uh, the main thing that changes is the interaction with the memory, okay? Each individual core is doing its own thing. It has its own pipeline stages and so on and so forth. That part doesn't change. But the part that changes is interaction into the memory. Why? Because memory is the unit that is shared among the cores. And if the data that these cores wants to talk about, you know, use is shared, then we're going to have two main problems in the memory. We're going to have what we call a memory consistency problem, and we're going to have a memory coherency problem. Both of them is because we are sharing things in the memory. And by the way, we need to share things in the memory. Otherwise, how can you kind of parallelize things if you're not sharing anything, right? If everybody is doing their own thing, there's no parallelism. So you need to share things. But given that this, you're sharing these things, now you're going to have lots of problems. OK? Uh, so let's first of all talk about this design choices, that how do we actually structure the memory to be shared? And then I'm going to talk about those two main problems. So, so there are two options that you can think about the cache when, we, when, we, when it comes to the main, uh, to the, to the multi-core system. One option is that we can share the cache among all the different cores, OK? So we have one cache that kind of like sits between cores and interconnect and connects to the memory. Everybody can read, read this cache and write to this cache, and we call this a shared cache system, OK? The second option is what we call a private cache system, which each core has its own cache. And then the other cores does not have connection to this cache because this is on-chip cache. And then everybody is, is connected to the interconnect. And then if they need something from the main memory, they have to go through the interconnect, OK? We call this a private cache system, OK? Everybody has their own cache. And of course, we can have something in between. 
before that, let's let's see what's the benefit of each of these private and shared. Uh, so let's talk about the hit time uh, between this shared model and this private model. Which one do you think has faster hit time? The private one uh, has faster hit time because, uh, sorry. The private one has faster hit time. Why? Because the connection between the core and the cache is an on-chip connection, much faster connection than this one that needs to go through the interconnect and then goes through the cache, okay? So the hit time of the private one is significantly better. But what about the miss rate? What do, which one do you think has a better miss rate? Uh, Consider two scenarios. One is cache-friendly applications, those that has lots of uh, you know, locality, and those that doesn't have any locality. For the first one, which one do you think is a better option? Any suggestions? Yeah. The shared one? Why? Okay, yeah. Uh, so someone says it's, it's similar because you have a lot, lot of locality anyways. So actually, you're going to have a better performance on this shared one. The reason for this is similar to the way that they describe fully associated versus direct map and talk about utilization. This one basically telling you that this cache is shared among four processes. If one process doesn't need any cache, but the other process needs a lot of cache, this system can provide you that, mm -hmm. right? Because this is shared, every, it's fair game for everybody. If one wants to use more cache and the other wants to, wants to use less cache, I can provide that. But versus this one is very rigid. So for example, if this core doesn't want to use any cache, but then this core wants to use lots of cache. You cannot kind of readjust this because these are kind of physical hardwired things. Versus for this one, anything that core zero doesn't use can be assigned to core one and core two and core three, right? So essentially for ca cache friendly systems, the private one is not the best, but the shared one is actually performing really well, okay? And then for the streaming application, for those applications that does not really use any cache, we go back to this private one uh, because private one performs better. The reason for this is that if I have an application that's kind of hugging the entire cache, it will produce lots of pollution, which other you know cores also will be kind of like you know uh, 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 um, suffer from it. Okay, so for example, if I have this core, uh, if I have this core that's kind of like, this core is kind of hugging the entire cache and maybe it just lets this tiny parts for the others, then the other ones, even if they are friendly, you know, applications, they have very, very limited space. Versus in this private one, if this core zero is kind of hugging its cache, it can only ruin this part. It can only include this part. These other parts are still reserved for these other cores, okay? So in other words, uh, depending on the application, each of these two designs might, might perform differently. And the hit time for, uh, for the private cache is significantly better. Uh, and uh, and then and then the the, the miss rate of, of the shared is usually much more better, but in, in, in on average it's it's kind of like a trade off between these two. One is better in some cases, the other one is better in the, some other cases. And then the last thing I want to talk about is the sharing. And the important thing about sharing is that actually, if you think about this shared and private, you will see that this. Shared cache system is much, much more easier for users to share things because you essentially put it in that shared cache. And if the other core wants to read it, it just goes into the cache and read it, right? So sharing is significantly easier in a shared cache system rather than a private cache system. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, you knew you you mean like pipe in 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 Python? Uh, yeah. So so the question is about using pipe between processes to share data. Uh, so that's very operating system dependent thing. Uh, it's huge, but yeah, at some point this might actually kind of like it will generate a shared page and then share those page between the two, and then you can write to that page and read from that page much faster. That's kind of like the idea. Yeah. Uh, the question is, what if each process has a cache-friendly uh, application? Which one would be better in that case? It depends. Uh, if all of them fits into their own small private cache, then yes, then the, the private cache is better. But consider, for example, one of them requires a little bit more and one of them requires a little bit less. In that case, then shared is going to be better. I mean, in summary, shared is better for utilizing more space. Private is better for accessing directly, right? Okay. So the, the, in order to kind of fix this trade-off, of course, we're gonna use the hybrid approach which we usually make the L1 cache private, okay? And then lower level cache, the last level cache shared, okay? Most of our modern multi-core systems follow this format, that L1 is private, L2, L3 is shared, okay? So this is kind of like, okay, if I have a small kind of task, I can quickly access it, but nobody else can access that. But then I'll also have level two or level three that is shared, so if you want to share anything, I can use it there. Okay, that's kind of the idea. All right, so we use hybrid and then that's it, right? Uh, the answer to this is no. And unfortunately, this private cache system is gonna create uh, two correctness issues, okay? In addition to those correctness issues, sometimes it's actually lead to performance issues, but not, that's not the story that we're gonna talk about in this class. Uh, this is uh, more of like an advanced topic that we're going to talk about in a more advanced computer architecture class. But let's talk about those correctness issues. The first one is what we call a cache coherency issue. And the cache coherency issue is that when we end up with incorrect copies in our private caches, okay? Uh, since each private cache has its own thing and doesn't share it with others, if they manage to somehow get an incorrect copy, which I'm gonna explain very soon, then we're gonna have what we call an incoherent cache, okay? Uh, so to give you an example of how this might happen, consider this like very simple example. Let's say there is this line Z that is shared between these two cores, core number one and core number two, okay? So let's say, for example, initially this Z is equal to zero and it's kind of saved somewhere here inside my main memory, okay? So let's say, for example, the first time core number one decide to read this Z, okay? And, and save it into some, some, some register. So since we are loading this Z, we're gonna put this Z in my L1 cache. This is the same thing that you did in your project. If it's a miss in your cache, you go to the main memory, bring it and put it in your cache, sure. And then there's, there's the, the other core that's reading the exact same Z, and, and this Z is actually shared between these two, these two cores. Think about this Z as the partial sum in the examples that I gave you, okay? So this Z is going to be, again, core two will see that, oh, it's not in my cache, and it's not in LLC, let's go and bring it from the memory, and they're gonna put it into the, their private cache as well, okay? So far, so good, no issue. Then at some point in the future, we're gonna have this issue where uh, one of the cores, let's say core number one, decides to update this value, okay? For example, let's say it decides to write 10 to this value that's supposed to be zero, okay? So core number one gonna store things, and then in order to store, it's gonna go to the cache and see, yes, it's in my L1. So what I can do is that I just update my Z to Z prime, and, and now Z is equal to 10. And since it's my L1, then there's nothing else I need to do. Let's say, for example, this is a write back strategy. I don't even need to uh, tell the main memory that this, this value is updated. Or it's, it might be right true. I might also tell the memory that this value is updated. So I'm gonna update the memory as well, okay? 
But in either of these cases, you're going to never tell core number two that, by the way, I updated this value z, OK? So what will happen at this point is core number two is going to read z again. It's going to go to its own L1 cache and see that, oh, OK, z is here. And the value that's stored here was 0. It's not 10, right? So it's going to load 10. And, sorry, it's going to load 0 and then continue, right? Whereas if you think about this ordering of this program, this was supposed to be a parallel programming system. So if core number 1 updated that z, everybody else should have seen that z, OK? But given that you're not seeing this updated value of C, we are ending up with this incorrect copy in my private cache in terms of core number two. And that's what we call a cache coherency problem, OK? That private caches don't talk to each other. And as a result, they might end up with inco incoherent copies, OK? The second problem that we're going to see, uh, by the way, we're going to talk about how do we fix this problem in the rest of this lecture. But before that, let's talk about the second problem. And that's what we call a consistency issue. So the consistency issue is when the ordering of the memories to different addresses is not seen by the other cores similarly. OK? So to give you an example, let's consider this example that we have core number one and core number two. And let's say core number one has one load that loads Z. It has a store that stored the value of x7 to y. And let's say x7 is 200 and x8 is 100. And then core number two is loading y and, and storing z, OK? So at the end of running this application, what do you think would be the value of x1 and x2? Any suggestions? So x1 is the value that is loaded from z, and x2 is the value that is loaded from y, OK? But these two values are also updated by, by some stores, OK? What do you think is the meaningful value for x1 and x2 is, or possible values for x1 and x2? Uh-huh. Sure. Can you give me one example? So the comment is, it's not deterministic, and we might see different values. Can you give me one example, one possibility? X1 is 100. OK. And X2? Uh, y is not 150. Uh, we just load it into, they start with 0, and, and then we, we might read something to it. So it could be, for example, 200, maybe. You had another suggestion? Yeah. Oh, wait, so first, like, if Z and Y initially have 0? Yes. Oh, then it's either going to be 100, 0, 200, 0, or 0, 0. 100, 0. 200, 0, or 0, 0. Can we have 100 and 200? Uh, no. Because no? Assuming that if you're doing some sort of out of order execution and you kind of solve the problem where the store is never going to happen before the load, mm -hmm. it's possible that. Why stores cannot happen before load? Um, or assuming that they're, they're executed in order in their own like respective thread. No, why? Um, I mean, these are separate addresses, right? Why we need to do it in order? Yeah, I guess it's the one. Okay. So we can actually have 100, 200 as well, right? So to kind of like summarize, depending on which order we see here, we might have different outputs, okay? And things get really, really, you know, fuzzy here. Because, for example, I can have something like this. This one, this one runs first, this one runs next, this one runs next, and this one runs next. That's one outcome. The other one that I can have is this one, this one, this one, this one, 
That's another outcome. Another outcome is this one, this one, this one, this one. Another outcome is this one, this one, this one, this one, and so on and so forth. So there's many, many different permutations that we might see. And then since these two are parallel, you have no idea which one happens first and which one happens second. And then the bigger problem is that even these two can be reordered if I have out of order execution. The reason for this is this is a store to address Y, and this is so this is load to address D, and these two addresses are separate from each other. So if I don't have something like an LSQ that or or LSQ is kind of resolved separately, then here I can reorder these things, but reordering these things will create issues for this other process, right? And they have no idea that this can cause a problem. Okay, and this is what we call a memory consistency issue. That depending on the ordering of these things, the value that we're going to see at the end of running this program is completely different. And as you, one of your students says, the bigger problem is each time that I run this, the value might be different. So it's not even determined. I cannot say that oh, it could be this, this one, this one, and this one. I run it today, and the value would be hundred and zero. Tomorrow it might be 200 and zero. The next day might be zero, zero. Okay, that's the problem with the consistency. Questions? Yeah. So the question is, isn't, isn't this a programmer issue? It is a programmer's issue because basically what we are writing here is a race condition. Depending on which one is going first, the value is different. So this is a bad style of programming. But in order to fix this, we need hardware to help us. Okay, so we're actually going to discuss how we fix this issue. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Zero, one hundred, zero, two hundred might happen. Uh, actually, so I mean, yeah. So what I mean here is zero, one hundred. So one of them is x, one of them is y. This one is y. This one is x. Kind of like separate. Yeah. I mean, x1 and x2. So this is x1, this is x2, this is x2, this is x1, something like that, right? I'm going to get back to this example, so we're going to talk about this. All right. Uh, so we're going to have correctness issues, the consistency and coherency. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about coherency issue and how to fix that. Next time, we're going to talk about consistency issue, and we're going to fix that as well. And if you have time, we're going to talk a little bit about the performance issues that multicore is going to have as well. All right? Uh, let's have a quick break, come back, and we're going to talk about coherency. All right. Okay, so let's revisit this problem one more time. As I said, given that we have a shared line Z, and again, the reason that we need to have a shared line is because we want to parallelize this algorithm, whatever it is, partial sum, I don't know, whatever else, and genomics, etc. And as a result, some of the memory lines has to be shared, okay? And I also need to have some private cache because if I don't have a private cache, it's not going to be fast enough, okay? So I need to have this private cache and I need to share this fly. These are two given things. And as a result of these two things, I'm going to have a coherency problem, okay? Um, so, so you might ask, okay, what if no sharing? What if no private cache? And as I already said, uh, these, are, these two are not an option. If you didn't have a shared cache, you didn't have a cache coherency problem. That's very simple, but we need sharing, okay? So let's actually talk about how we can fix this. And let's just start with the definition of what is a coherent cache. What do we want to have in a multi-core system, okay? We call a cache coherent if you have these three things, okay? Uh, we basically say read what is written. So essentially every core needs to see what is written by itself and by other cores, okay? If at any given point we see the most updated thing in my, in my own private cache, then I'm, it's guaranteed I'm going to have 
a coherent, coherent system, right? The second thing is that we have to see causality of, 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 of rights, right? Which means that, you know, every right should, if, if I have two consecutive rights, then I have to see this first and then I have to see this next. If I see them in other, other way around, then I'm going to have a non-coherent system, right? And, and, and then, uh, and then I need to essentially these these two things kind of like you know same thing in some sense that I need to see the right things on my own cache. I need to also see the rights that happens by the other course. Okay, so these two together it gives me this most updated uh, uh, copy, and then I need to see the correct order of these rights as well. If I have all these three, then I'm going to have a a coherent cache. Uh, so the first thing that comes to mind is can I fix this in software? Can I write better algorithms such that it doesn't give me the coherency issue? And the answer to this is no. And the reason for this is that caches are not visible to software, okay? I cannot really do things in software as a programmer to kind of fix the coherency issue. What I can do though is maybe I can add some instructions in order to, to fix this. And in fact, most of the modern systems has some instructions to invalidate things inside the cache, okay? Uh, uh, CF flush, for example, is one example in x86 that what it does is basically kind of evict everything from the caches if you put the address next to it, okay? Uh, it's, it's helpful and it does the job and does the trick, but it's very, very inefficient because essentially for every single access, you kind of need to keep track of this at the software level. So bottom line is software solutions is not the most efficient solutions for this. We need to change hardware and you need to fix this at the hardware level, okay? So what is the solution? The solution is we need what we call a cache coherency protocol. We need some sort of rules, okay? And of course, their implementation in hardware that basically tell us what to do when there is a load, when there is a store, what each core needs to do for each load and which each store, what memory needs to do, and so on and so forth. If we follow this, then we basically have what we call a cache coherency protocol. Okay, and the very simple rule is kind of see something, say something kind of thing. That if you, if the main reason that we don't have coherent caches is that the private caches don't talk to each other. If we somehow manage to find the solution for these caches to talk to each other, then we're not gonna have a coherency problem, okay? So how do we do this? We're gonna use this thing called snooping uh, uh, cache coherency system. Which the idea is that we're going to snoop the cache and whatever happens, we're going to tell everybody else, okay? If we do this correctly with some protocols that I'm going to explain, then we're going to have a cache coherency protocol. The very simple one is basically think about this something like this, okay? That I have my private caches here. This is my cores and this is my private cache. This is my shared cache. And all of them are kind of connected to this bus, okay? So what will happen is, if there is a write, for example, if there's an SW from the CPU that's kind of write Z here, if Z kind of announced this, broadcast this write to this bus, everybody else who has a copy of this Z knows that something is happening to this Z so they can update themselves, okay? So essentially, everybody kind of snoops on this line and everything that happens, everybody will broadcast, everybody will listen, and they're gonna do a proper action based on this broadcast, okay? This is how we're gonna implement this cache coherency protocol. There is another way of doing this, which we call directory based, that I'm gonna talk about if you have time this lecture or maybe next lecture. But the one that we're gonna mainly focus is this concept of snooping caches, okay? So how does it work? Uh, so first of all, where do we kind of like uh, uh, kind of store this metadata that somebody has it? So we're going to basically kind of store some states for each line. Where are we going to store the states? We can store it with the lines. Think about this as this is kind of similar to what we had for an LRU, 
right? We had the position stored with the line. We can have the coherency states also stored with the lines, okay? So each line has one more bit or two more bits for storing their coherency state, okay? So what are those states? So think about like what will happen for a write and for, for a read, okay? Let's start with the write miss, okay? So if the address is not in the cache, okay, and, and we want to perform a write, uh, what should we do, okay? And then the, the next thing is, if the address is not in the cache and we want to read, what should we do, okay? And then there is also write head and read head, and we're gonna talk about each one, uh, one by one. So first of all, let's talk about write miss, okay? So write miss, write miss means that I have a stored word, for example, for address Z, and it's not in my cache, okay? So what we need to do is that I need to write the memory, but as we are writing it to the memory, I need to broadcast this to everybody else that everybody listen, I'm going to update line Z. So everybody else, those of, those of cores that has the copy of Z needs to what we call invalidate themselves because now their copy that they have is no longer a valid copy because this value is getting updated, right? So they have to invalidate themselves. They have to evict the data that they have, get rid of that data and let the memory be updated and then read the correct data next, okay? So whenever we, we, want, to, we want to write a new value, everybody else has to invalidate, invalidate themselves if they have the copy. If they don't have the copy, then there's nothing to be worried about, okay? Uh, on the read miss, what we need to do is is we need to write the data from the main memory, right? So let's say I have core number one and core number two, they have their own caches, okay? And I have the main memory here, for example, okay? So let's say this, this cache, this, this CPU wants to read address Z and it's not in their cache. So they have to go through the memory and read it, okay? So they can go to the memory and bring the data back and we're good to go. Uh, but one problem that we need to be careful about is that if the copy is already existed into this, this other core, core number one, let's say this is core zero, this is core one, if the data is already in this cache, then we have to be checking one important thing. And that is that if this data is dirty, remember that we had the write back and the data was dirty. If they, this data is dirty, then the copy that I have in the memory is not the same as the copy that I have in this private cache. They are not the same. So what I need to do is that I need to write this back to the main memory, make this an updated copy, and then forward this to this to this core. Okay. So on a read miss, I need to go to the main memory, but the important step is if other cores have a copy of that data and that copy is the dirty copy. It needs to be written back to the main memory. Main memory will get updated and then that data will be uh, forwarded to, to the core, okay? So this is one thing that we need to, uh, we need to do. If there is no uh, you know, dirty line or there is no copy of this data somewhere else, then we can just read it from the main memory the same way that we did before, okay? Uh, so let's see how this will help us with this with this example. Uh, and then I'm going to more formally describe this cache coherence protocol. We call this MI or Modified Invalidate Coherence Protocol. Uh, so later I'm going to describe this in more formal manner. But I just wanted to give you two examples of this. Okay. So let's going back to this example and see how this is fixed using this very simple approach that I told you. Okay, so the first one uh, is a load miss, okay? So core number one wants to read Z, Z is, is in the memory. So uh, core number one wants to read it. There is no other copy in other cores, right? So we just read it from the memory and that's it. So this one is good, okay? Then the second core comes and then this one also wants to read the same thing. And, uh, and then what happens is that again, this one needs to go to the memory there is a copy of Z in another core, but since this is not a dirty copy, nothing needs to be done. So this Z again will be forwarded here. And again, we are good to go, okay? 
Now we are going to this core number one, and this core number one needs to write to this Z, okay? And based on the protocol that I just described, uh, whenever I have a write, okay, this one will create a Z star, which is like a dirty copy of Z. But since I told you that on the, on the right miss or in generally on the right, I need to tell everybody that I'm writing. So everybody has to invalidate their data, okay? So on the right, core number one gonna announce that I'm writing to this line in this interconnect. And core number two will listen to this interconnect and see that, oh, I have this line Z on my core. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to invalidate. I'm gonna remove this line from my core, okay? So now what happens at this point is that core number one has a dirty copy of Z, memory has a, an old copy of Z, and core number two has no copy of Z, okay? Now finally, we have this scenario here that core number two again wants to read Z. In this case, it has to read it from the main memory, but the difference is that we're gonna again announce this on this interconnect, core number one gonna see that, oh, somebody wants to read Z, so what I should do is that I should get rid of this and I need to update this Z here with Z, Z star. So I need to write back my data and then this Z stars will be updated here. I actually don't need to remove it. I just keep it here, but I just update my main memory, okay? And as you can see at this point, both of them have the correct copy. Memory also has the correct copy and nothing bad happens, right? On the right miss, where is it right miss? Mm -hmm. No, no, here, you mean here? No, we don't do right back here, right? So, so at this point, so the question is, do we need to do, why do we do it right back here? We don't do right back, okay? So at this point, what we had before here was that I had Z here. So initially I had Z here and Z here, okay? Now we go to this step and now core number one wants to write to Z, right? So this Z becomes Z star, okay? But the important thing here is that this write needs to be announced, okay? And as a result, since I have a copy of Z here, I need to invalidate this Z, okay? I invalid. I don't write it back, I just invalidate this Z, okay? Now, the question is, when I'm writing to this Z star, do I need to also update my memory or not? So, because my memory was Z and then I'm writing to this and make it Z star. Do I need at the same time update my memory or not? And that's the story of write back versus write through. If I had the write back strategy, I just update my local copy. I don't tell anything to my main memory. If I had write through strategy, then I have Z star here and Z star here at the same time. So the next time that this loads comes in, I actually, this write back doesn't need to be happen anymore because there is no write back. I just get the copy from here and that's it. But at the end, all of them will have Z star and that's the point. Mm -hmm. So great question. The question is, on a read miss, basically here, this one needs to write back to the memory and then this data has to be forwarded here. So we're kind of like doing a very, very long path. Why don't we, for example, forward from here to here? Is that your question, right? Yeah, or for example, I write here and then come from here, right? 
I can do all those things. And that's actually what we're going to talk about. So all these optimizations can run on top of it. But the point here is that in order for this to work, the correctness, I only need two states, M and I. Essentially, I only need to know whether I have the correct copy or don't. That's all I need. But of course, there are going to be E state and S state and F state. I'm going to actually give you four more states in addition to M and I just for improving the performance. Yeah, so just a question. So you mentioned like write back and write through. So are we doing a write through on the second 4-1 instruction or are we only doing it just before the four two, the last 4-2 instruction? Uh, so for if I have a write through, it will happen at this point, okay? So when I'm doing the store, not only I update my cache, I'll also update my main mode. And that, that happens every single time it's yeah, the question is that happens every single time that we store something. Yes, that's the whole point of write through. That's why it it it's kind of consume a lot of bandwidth. That's why we usually do write back because then it only goes through my cache and nobody else really needs to know. Sorry, just to follow up with that is so the other approach would be the write back approach, but that would be done only before core two is plus one. Exactly. So the other option, the comment is the other option it would be write back option. That write back option happens at this point here. That core two wants to read something. Core one sees that. It's going to update the memory and then the, the value will be forwarded to core two. Okay. So these two states, whether I have the correct copy or I don't have anything, is, is what we call coherent states. I, I gave you two, a name for it, what we call a modified state or M, an invalid state or I, and this is MI. Think about it as bits. So for example, this is zero bits, this is one bit. If I have one flag bit in my line, in my cache, I can basically tell whether I'm in the I state or whether I'm in M state, okay? Uh, so if I have the valid copy, it's the most updated one, we call it an M state. If I don't have the copy, we call it an invalidate state, uh, we call it an I state, okay? Uh, so this is basically what we call an MI coherence protocol, okay? Uh, to give you a little bit more example, let's say I have three cores, each one, and I'm talking about one line, let's say line Z. So each line, as I said, either have M state or I state, okay? And let's say, for example, I have a sequence like this. I'm gonna write it like this, okay? Uh, R1, R write one, like write two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This means that I'm gonna that core number one going to read. This is like a load word core number one. This is going to be store word core number one. This is a store word core number two, and so on and so forth. And these are all for one particular address, okay? We have the states for every single address in my cache, okay? I'm just showing it for one address, but consider this that it's actually repeating for every single address that we have in the cache, okay? So let's talk about what is happening with each of these. Initially, you can consider that all of them is in I state. Nobody has a valid copy, okay? And now let's, for example, consider a sequence like this, that the core number one decides to read. What will happen is that nobody else has the data, so core number one will go to the M state. Everybody else stays in the I state, okay? So after running this, this would be the updated coherent states for all these three cores, okay? Now, for example, let's say that core number one decides to write on the same address. Uh, since core number one is already in the M state, it stays in the M state because I still am, I'm the one that has the correct copy. Everybody else stays in their I state, okay? Because they don't have the copy, okay? Now, now let's say that we have write by core number two, okay? Uh, in this stage, what will happen is that since the other core wants to update this value, core number one has to go to the invalid states because no longer the value that it has is a correct copy. So it has to go to the invalid state, which means that it has to evict this content from its own cache. On the other hand, core number two goes to the M state and core number three stays in the invalid state. Uh, one important thing here is that if there's any write back happening, the write back should happen at this point as well because the copy needs to be updated to the, to the main memory, okay? Uh, for example, an alternative to this would have been, let's say, 
Uh, let me show it with a different color. Instead of W2, let's say, for example, we had R3. If you had R3, what would have happened instead of this would be uh, core number one stays, uh, core number one, again, goes to the I state. The core number two stays in the I state, and now core number three goes to the M state. And again, if there is any write back, the write back should go to, to the main memory, and, and this value should be read, read from the main memory. So it cannot be directly forwarded from core number one to core number three. Core number one has to write it to the main memory, and core number three has to read it from the main memory. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so, so there is no connection between the caches, okay? The caches are only connected to a lower level, okay? They cannot talk to each other. Snooping policy does apply here. So the question is, what does snooping means here? The snooping means that if there is R3, R1 will see that request, which means that telling, oh, somebody else trying to read this line so what R1 uh, core number one will do is that it's going to write back that data to the main memory so that if core number three wants to read that data, it reads the correct copy. What you're asking is why core number one is not just forwarding that value to core number three, and that's a good question, and we're going to add that state. But with M and I, I cannot do that, okay? M and I is, is just either I have it or I don't have it. There's no sharing between us, okay? Does that make sense? So we're this one. So core number one was here, right? And then now core number two wants to write to the to the to the to that address. Okay. So what will happen is that this one needs to go to the main memory and update that. Then uh, core number two gonna get that value and then update that value. Does that make sense? Question. So the reason is that everybody needs to see the rights. You cannot skip the rights. So if it's W1, W2, W3, W4, everybody writes to the main memory, get the correct copy, and then the other one will write it internally. Otherwise, um, if I skip the rights, somebody will not see that rights, and that's not going to be a coherent cache by definition. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is that are we doing write allocate here? Yes, we, we do write allocate. So we do write back write allocate in this, this example. Yeah. Uh, the question, why R3 invalidates M here? Because the data can only be in one core with M and I, okay? I cannot share between them, okay? So if I is in M and then three is also in M, then I won't know which one is has the correct copy. So this is only, only M or I. Yeah. Uh, so also, like, so like all of is Uh, so the question is, what is happening with the out of order execution? What I'm showing here is from the memory's perspective, okay? So I still haven't discussed what is happening inside the cores, but this is the order that the memory sees. And we are assuming that magically we fix that internal ordering, so we see everything in order. But that's a separate problem that we're going to fix as well later on when we're talking about consistency. Yes. So the question is, what will happen if I have like core number one and core number three both in M? The problem is this, that if core number three, two, for example, wants to read or write, how do you know which of these has the correct copy that needs to be written to, 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 the, to the main? Who, who, gets the, who gets to say which one is the correct write back data? 
if they're not the same, right? I'm actually gonna sh give you S state, which is the shared state, and, and that's gonna fix this problem. So just hold that thought for a minute and it's gonna, it's gonna be fixed, yeah. And again, do you either, you are the exclusive owner of things, okay? You either have it or don't have it. You cannot share it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, I mean, now you kind of now know why we need the sharing, right? So you already asked this question. So you see that there are examples that it doesn't make any sense for for not sharing things, right? If both of them wants to read, why don't both of them go to the same state, right? So this is what we call an S state or the shared state. So essentially, instead of having a, an M and I, let's have an MSI or shared, modified, and invalid. That if both of them wants to read, both of them, instead of like one goes to M and the other one goes to I, maybe both of them can go to S, okay? So this is what we call a um, MSI coherence protocol. What I'm adding here is another S. And as I said, later on, I'm going to add an O, an E, and an F to this as well. So I'm going to have a, like a full-on six-letter uh, coherence protocol. But this basic one is this MSI one that's really most of the systems require. The MI is the Basically, you only need MI for your cache coherency to work, but this is very inefficient. So you need an MSI for your efficient cache to work. These other O, E, and F that I'm going to describe later is just an optional things that some of the cache has and some of the cache doesn't. Okay. So what is this shared, modified, and valid? What's the difference between shared and modified? The difference between shared and modified is that if if I have the clean copy of data and everybody else also has the clean copy, we all go to this shared state, okay? If somebody wants to update this data, wants to make this data dirty, then that one goes to the M state, to the modified state, and we all go to the invalid state, okay? I cannot be in the shared state if somebody else trying to write to this data. I can only stay in the shared state if everybody wants to just read this data. Okay, so that's the basic difference. Let me give you an example. Uh, and by the way, as I said, this dirty line is only when we have the right back strategy. Uh, and in order to find whether or not this line is dirty is by having a dirty bit. So essentially just a one flag that's, that's either zero or one for each line. And as I said, for, for, for now, on, I mainly focus on right back and right allocate. Because uh, most of our systems are basically based on that, okay? So let's see the same thing that we had before. This time I have MSI, and again, this is happening for all the lines. I'm just showing it for line Z, okay? So initially, let's say all of them is an I. Uh, let's say we want to do R1. So what happened at this point is that uh, core number one wants to read. Everybody else is in I state. What changed now is instead of going to the M state, I go to the S state, okay? Uh, the reason for this is that I want to read a clean copy. Nobody else has it. So instead of going to the modified state, now I go to the, M, uh, to the S state, okay? Now, for example, if core number two also wants to read this, mm -hmm. core number two also goes to the, uh, sorry, this is I, I, and then this is after this. Now, if core number two wants to read it, core number one stays in the S state, core number two also goes into the S state, and core number three goes, stays in I state, okay? So that, that's the difference, that now I can have two cores staying in the same shared state, okay? So let's, for example, give you another alternative. Let's say, for example, uh, uh, we want to do write one instead of R1. In that case, instead of going from I to S, I would go from I to M, and everybody else just stays at the I, okay? So now, if somebody wants to read something, uh, so now, if for example, I have R2, what will happen is that since I'm in the modified state, core number one is in the modified state, it has to write back and then go to the shared state, okay? So the difference between these two is that 
in the first scenario, I go to the S. The second core comes and that second core also goes to the S. In the, in the second scenario, the first, core, the first core first writes. So now it has a dirty copy. Now the second core wants to read. What will happen is that at this point, I need to write back the data. And now since I now have the clean copy, now I can go safely to the S. So at this point, both of us goes to the S and then things continue. Okay, so now, for example, if core number three wants to read, then this one also goes to the S. If it's right, then this one goes to the M and everybody else goes to the I. Okay, if somebody wants to write, no longer you have the correct copy, so you have to invalidate yourself. You go to the I and core number three goes to the M. Okay, question. Uh, the question is why write back doesn't happen immediately because that's the difference between write back strategy and write through strategy. Write through was happening immediately. Write back, you're saving it and only writing it when it's done. So you're saving bandwidth in between your memory and your cache. So that if you have two like consecutive writes, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So it's because of consecutive writes. You kind of filter it to your main memory. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. The question was like, if he had the right miss from separate cores, we usually do the right. I mean, you can have an optimization that if you have two consecutive right, like W1 and W2, W1 needs to be, can be skipped, but we typically don't do that from the memory perspective for other reasons. Yes. So if you do R1, R2, R3, you end up with SSS. Yes. If you do W3, then it becomes IIM. Yeah. No, no. So the question is why we have SSI? Because we have something like this. So first of all, all of them starts at I, okay? Then I have R1. R1 means that now core number one goes to S, but the others doesn't need to go to S, right? Now I have R2, then this goes to S, but still I3 does there no need to for, and then if any time in future you have R3, then this one goes to S. Uh, because, so the question is, how come we had MII and MII twice? Because I had write one, and then I had another read one. If I have, sorry, if I have, no, what I said here. Yeah, this one should have been, I don't know what I said here, but essentially, if I have R1, W1, W2, okay, this means that MI, and then this one goes again to MI, stays in MI, right? Because I was the only one who had the copy, I still the only one who has the copy, right? So two back-to-back -back MIs, and then for this second one, then this goes to I, and this one goes to I, okay? And then you have a right back here, okay? Uh, so the question about what, what is happening really in invalidation, you, you just change the bit to, yes, it's a force eviction. You just change the valid bit to zero. Yeah. Yes. So, so if you have R1, R2, W3, you had SSI. After this becomes 
M I I. Okay. If you have a right, everybody has to be valid. That's that's the rule. Uh, this is kind of like a summary of this. I'll let you guys to take a look at it. Uh, but generally, this is kind of telling you what will happen at this even given point. Uh, so now the question is, what can we do in order to make this even better? Okay, how to optimize MSI? Uh, I'm gonna quickly go over one of them, and then I'm gonna let uh, talk about the others uh, in the next lecture. Uh, so, so there are three optimizations that we can do. I'm gonna describe each one one by one. They're kind of separate from each other. They're also kind of relevant to each other, but either of them are optional. So the first one is uh, if I have a core in S, okay, and and that issue is right, okay. It needs to broadcast to everybody, right? So if I'm in S and I want to write, I need to tell everybody that I'm writing, okay? But if I'm only the, the only one who, who are in the S, I don't even need to broadcast it to someone, right? I can just, just go to M myself without telling anybody else, okay? So this is what we call an exclusive state instead of S. The, the difference between E, exclusive, and S, shared, is that and if everybody is in I, the first one who wants to read, instead of going to S, goes to E, which is the exclusive. Then if that same core wants to keep reading and writing, uh, instead of telling everyone anything about that, I, as long as I'm an exclusive one, I don't need to tell anyone anything, okay? So I'm saving a lot of bandwidth in terms of broadcast. I stay in E and do everything I want. And then more importantly, if I want to write anything, I can silently go from E to M, again, without broadcasting, because again, I'm guaranteed that I'm the only one who has this data, okay? I only go from E to S if someone else wants to read this data or someone else wants to write to this data, okay? If someone wants to write to this data from E, I go to I. If someone wants to read this data, I go from E to S, okay? And that's when I'm going to broadcast. So the difference between E and S is E is the exclusive state, which means that the only core that has this data is, is that core. The reason for this is that this is very useful for non-shared data, because for non-shared data, one core only has it, but since we need to kind of like, for every read and write, we need to broadcast it to every other core, I'm kind of like basically wasting the bandwidth, right? If I'm the only one who has it, why do I even need to tell anybody that I have it, right? Only if everybody else wants to read it, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to broadcast it. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, does that make this a little bit more complicated because now I need to check E? No, it's actually very simple because uh, Every time somebody wants to read, they just broadcast that line, and the E one is the one that has, needs to pick it up, right? So anyway, you wanted to broadcast that anyway, right? But, but this one is just... So it's on the other hand that if you read or write on the E state, you don't need to tell anyone. Yeah. You cannot go back from S to E. You can go from M to E, right, if everybody else is, is not is not updating anything. Uh, but you cannot go from S to E. Because think about this, if everybody is in shared, they only invalidate themselves if somebody goes to M. Otherwise, they stay there, right? Yeah. So if for every, every time we had M to the key, it would say, oh yeah, I've updated it, I've updated it every single time? Yes, but now you don't need to. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna have what we call an MESI or MESI protocol which uh, essentially the same thing as MSI. The only difference is that if I'm in I and the only one who has who wants to read this data, I go from I to E. And then if I want to do the modify, I don't need to tell anybody that I'm in, 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 in E. I just silently from E go to M without broadcasting. So this is more of an optimization in terms of bandwidth, okay? And then if I'm in the E and somebody else wants to read it from E, I go to S. 
Uh, if I'm in the E and somebody wants to write it, I go to I and that, that core goes to M and so on and so forth. I'm going to give you an example next time uh, so that you can see the difference between it. All right. Thank you.